What's up guys, we're back with another educational video and this week we were talking about red meat consumption, specifically beef, and the risk of cardiovascular disease. But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment. Oh, the algorithm! So this comes from a recent meta-analysis looking at random human randomized control trials on beef intake and cardiovascular disease markers. So they were looking at things like apolipoprotein B, apolipoprotein A, HDL, non-HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and blood pressure. What's important to note here is they only used human randomized control trials, so no observational studies, which can be confounded by healthy user bias, and they were only using studies that used either unprocessed or minimally processed sources of beef. And that's important because processed meat in studies where they include both tends to drive the risk of increased heart disease. And it's possibly not even the processing because it's very difficult to disentangle the fact from high amounts of processed red meat consumption typically mean high intakes of processed food consumption, i.e. like fast food. It's difficult to disentangle is the processed beef causing this, is the beef causing this, or is it just a poor overall diet quality? It's important that they only included randomized control trials here. And what they found was beef really didn't change any of the markers of cardiovascular disease risk, like blood pressure, apolipoprotein B, apolipoprotein A, non-HDL cholesterol, HDL, didn't really change any of them. The only thing they saw was it did increase LDL cholesterol by a very small amount, 2.7 milligrams per deciliter, which is a very, very small amount. But they did what's called a sensitivity analysis. Now, when you're doing a meta-analysis, you're including multiple studies. One of the things they do in good meta-analyses is include sensitivity analysis, meaning do the results hold if they remove a study? So they'll go through the results and remove one study at a time and look to see if the results hold because it's important that you don't want the results to be overly influenced by one singular study. And in fact, in this meta-analysis, they found that when they removed a specific study that it did change the results and there was no change in LDL cholesterol. Now, it's important to point out that beef, red meat, tends to have higher amounts of saturated fat. So if you're eating a lot of fatty cuts of beef, it would not surprise me if it increased your LDL cholesterol because you're eating a lot of saturated fat. But while carnivores will tell you that LDL cholesterol doesn't matter, and in a weird, odd way, they are kind of maybe a tenth right, and that it is, it is not the cholesterol itself or the LDL molecule. It is the lipoprotein that is on LDL cholesterol. So your lipoproteins, these proteins that contain lipids and deliver them to your cells, to your periphery, they all have one protein on them that allows them to interact with the cells it's trying to get to and then go into those cells. And in the case of things like VLDL cholesterol, uh, LDL cholesterol, and uh, basically all non-HDL cholesterol, the protein is apolipoprotein B. And apolipoprotein B specifically appears to be uniquely atherogenic because VLDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and IDL cholesterol, which are basically summed up are all non-HDL cholesterols, all of them can penetrate the endothelium and they all carry one apolipoprotein B molecule. Now, once they penetrate the endothelium and they're inside the intima, that apolipoprotein B can undergo enzymatic modification that causes it to be retained within the intima, and it retains that cholesterol that's in the cell and the lipids along with it, okay? Now, VLDL, which is larger molecules, they don't penetrate the endothelium as easy as LDL, and LDL doesn't penetrate the endothelium as easily as IDL. But on the whole, LDL is probably the biggest source of cholesterol that gets deposited, as well as apolipoprotein protein B, into the endothelial space. So, for example, so something like IDL, which is a smaller apolipoprotein B containing lipoprotein, IDLs will more easily penetrate the endothelium because they're smaller, but they carry less overall cholesterol. Whereas LDLs penetrate the endothelium 
less easily than IDLs, but they carry more cholesterol per particle. And so the net effect is basically kind of an equal atherogenic summation. And so some people have argued that instead of worrying about LDL cholesterol, which is just a surrogate marker for apolipoprotein B, we should just measure apolipoprotein B because that's a better indicator. Now, some studies show that apolipoprotein B is a better measure. Some show non-HDL cholesterol is a better measure. They're all going to be pretty close because they're a proxy for apolipoprotein B. You know, it's very hard to argue with the research literature. They have shown at every single level in mechanistic studies, in randomized control trials, in Mendelian randomization trials, in observational studies, that these things track. They have very clearly defined the mechanism by which LDL cholesterol or apolipoprotein B can injure your endothelial lining. And that injury causes cholesterol to begin to accumulate there. And that injury also causes inflammatory markers and things like macrophages to be recruited to that site, which can cause all kinds of other problems and eventually lead to a heart attack or some sort of cardiovascular blockage. So in this study, the take home is in these randomized control trials with using unprocessed beef, it doesn't appear to change these risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Now, that being said, it's important to point out that plant sources of protein tend to decrease these risk factors. So on a per protein basis, plant protein is probably more protective for cardiovascular disease than animal protein. But on the flip side, animal protein is higher quality protein. It contains some other beneficial nutrients like heme iron, which is more bioavailable. And so I'm not saying you have to do one or the other. Again, these are not mutually exclusive. If you're getting in enough plant protein and enough plant material overall and high fiber, you're getting a lot of those benefits of cardiovascular disease protection. And then if you're getting in some high quality animal protein that's mostly unprocessed, you're getting the benefits of high quality bioavailable protein with a great amino acid profile. So again, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Both have benefits. But again, it doesn't appear that beef uniquely raises the risk of cardiovascular disease as long as you're not eating a lot of fatty cuts of beef or highly processed beef. Now, it's important to point out this study did receive funding from the Beef Checkoff Group, which is a uh, beef lobbying group. Now, I know everyone was going to lose their minds and be like, we got to, no, this study doesn't mean. Keep in mind, this study is a meta-analysis, meaning it is a study of studies that already exist. So if this meta-analysis was done improperly, then anyone can show how these authors did it improperly because they can go conduct the same analysis because all these studies already exist. So just yelling about the funding source and saying the funding source, the funding source, the funding source. Okay, well then explain how they did the meta-analysis wrong. Explain how the statistical analysis was wrong, or their inclusion criteria was wrong, or their exclusion criteria is wrong. Personally, I think it was fine based on the inclusion-exclusion criteria, and I didn't see anything particularly wrong with the statistical analysis. So if anyone wants to argue about it, that's fine. I'm sure you will in the comments, and I'm sure it will be something like, rumble, rumble, loud noise, doesn't fit my bias. Ah. All right, guys, hope you liked the video, and I'll catch you next week.